there is something intuitive in the philosophical principle being presented that right. we go, it's, it's like you knew it all along, but you, you yeah. sort of, you just sort of realize that you knew it all along. And this right? person was like the, the guide yeah. that helped you to realize this thing right. that you already knew. That and Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. And we're here again to speak with you about Near Automata. Yep. We left off right as they get to the amusement park. That was yeah. kind of the stopping point last time. So we're going to pick up from there. Um, again, we kind of asked everyone to play up through ending A. I was not quite able to finish it. I got close, but not quite. So... Uh, we're still not up to where we told people to play the first episode, but I, I'm, I'm still not sure that we'll even get all the way through the material yep. that we have here for notes. I have a lot of notes, so. Um, uh, there was a comment, and I can't remember who it came from, speaking about the depth of philosophy that's possible to sort of get into with this game. I'm not saying that to like make any sort of excuse mm. yet, <laughs> <laughs> but more to say that like I was planning on doing a lot more talking about philosophy in this yeah. episode based okay. on who I knew, like which characters we were going to uh, find. I see, of course. But you actually don't even learn the name of the one boss until the B playthrough when you play as 9S. So as of right now, like that philosopher's name which still boss, but yeah, hasn't don't. even come up. Okay. So like <laughs> I was going to read the second sex, for instance, but it's oh, like sure, sure. I, there's not really a point in doing that yet because sure. we don't even know the name of that character right. until I think B playthrough there's, so. there's a couple characters that, and sometimes it's it's presented in that weird alphabet, this weird yeah. um, yes. Yoko Taro right. alphabet, where right. it's like you see it. You can I think at the very beginning yeah. that like large uh, Titan Goliath thing yes. that we fought. Mm -hmm. um, there's a name to it that we will go over probably next episode. Yes, <laughs> because it's written in this garbled, can't be translated language, but that also has reference to some philosophy. Right. So, so there's a lot of stuff that yeah. could come up now, but I don't think it makes sense to do it yet because okay. there's going to be extra context in the B playthrough where a lot of those things will come up in a different, sort of from a different perspective. Cool. So I'm going to kind of hold off on uh, Simone de Beauvoir for now. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about Pascal, of course, and a little bit about Jean-Paul Sartre, but not like a ton. Oh, good. Okay. Quite yet. Sartre. Sartre. Whatever it's supposed to be Sartre. pronounced. Um, so yeah. anyway, the, I just want to kind of throw that out there now is it's not because I'm not reading it because I am actually, I actually am reading these books, but <clears throat> I just don't think like at this particular point in a playthrough that it's like the right time to bring it all up now. It's like we need okay. a little bit more no, that game. Makes sense. That makes we need sense. a little bit more context before it makes sense to really dive yeah. into it. So this will be more Good. of a, Good. and I think this works anyways, because if we're going to have to go through much of the same content again in B playthrough, we got to have more stuff to talk. They're going to have more stuff to talk <laughs> yeah. about, and I think it'll be good to do it then I rather agree. than now, where we can just kind of focus on the story and events that happen. Totally agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of the plan for today's episode. Perfect. So that's what we're going to do. So the amusement park. Yep. Um, we get a lot more of the same kind of dialogue from the machines, where they're expressing. They are. Um, sentiments, feelings, emotions that they shouldn't be feeling. It's right. becoming much more obvious that this is yeah. not random as 9S was claiming that it was. Yeah. Saying things like, oh, what fun. Let's be happy together. Yeah. As they're in and the they're, amusement they're park. They're on parade. They're marching through. They're throwing confetti. They're, they yeah. got the jester hats on. Like, yep. They're they're way into it. And they're just having a blast. Yeah. And we kill them all. <laughs> Almost <laughs> they're all of them. Not at all. least mimicking things yeah. in, in in a way that makes it clear that they understand to some degree yeah. like what they're doing right and the why context they're doing of it. the situation yes. and what to do yeah right so clearly this is not just like random data that they've accessed um yeah so yeah there's there's a tank shooting confetti that's right uh and there's like a machine in there let's sing let's sing um and 9S mentions a couple things. First of all, what the, well, this is weird. So he's no longer sitting there going, 
Like, it's meaningless. Yeah, yeah this useless. is meaningless. Just don't pay attention right. to it. Now he's even kind of questioning it a bit. Right. And then he says, these machines are heavily armed. Do you really think it's a good idea to leave that tank behind? I think you could fight this thing if you wanted to. Hmm. I didn't. Okay. Did you fight the tank? Yes. <laughs> okay. Tell me about what happens because I oh, didn't no, do it. It just turns into a, a whole uh, scene. It's it's a pretty big fight. Yeah. <clears throat> and the tank just immediately on, on like a dime, it just turns on its military systems. And it's just like, <laughs> boom, starts shooting at you. And um, it takes a little while, but you eventually destroy the whole thing. Yeah. I figured. kill lots of other I robots. I figured that this would be something where you have a choice here where you could or could not engage it so i chose not mm, to because yeah. i figured maybe that you would so <laughs> yeah you can just How'd bypass you know? it completely yeah and um that's what he says and then she says uh, in response to that if they're not hostile fighting them is a waste of time right yeah, then you can okay. kind of just move past it altogether and just yeah. not even engage it well i mean i got that dialogue but i anyways i uh didn't yeah uh so you get onto this roller coaster and it's kind of zooming around uh, you're shooting robots as they come at you, but there's some good dialogue here. Um, so 9S says, hey, 2B, people who know me well usually call me nines, nines. which is kind of funny because, you know, it's the the number nine with an S on the end. So yeah, nines. 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 So, you know, it's kind of a clever looking nickname. Yeah. Um, she's like, uh, so what do you think? And she's like, of what? I mean, if you wanted to call me nines, it's totally okay. And she's like, I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. You know, all right. So she's not going to do it. She's not going to call him by a nickname. She's going to yeah. call him 9S. 9S is just fine. Well, that's funny, though, because she, uh, 2B, was very adamant that, uh, at how 9S address her when they were up in the bunker. Yes. And was saying, don't call me that. Don't talk to me don't like that. Don't call me ma'am. Um, yep. And it was more like telling you to not be so formal right yep but then she isn't really willing to reciprocate that nope <laughs> for him in any meaningful way at least not at the moment yep kind of funny i mean it, yeah. it, it gives you reason to believe that he would expect she'd be willing to do that because right. of the fact that she said don't call me ma'am but yeah. then and, and it's just you know clearly he likes her like right like he's clearly like emitting <laughs> that energy and so right. he he like gets the courage i guess to try to ask her to be less formal with him and then she just which is totally a big deal like in japan it. it's a big deal um oh that's true to do that uh yeah. when you ask somebody like in you know japanese culture when you say hey can we just speak informally um yes th that's sort of an admission of like hey we're close now kind of thing or like let's let's not worry about that anymore for somebody who's like a, a co-worker um, usually whoever's older gets to speak informally and whoever's younger has to speak formally yeah. a at any time when it's like, Hey, let's not do that anymore. It's a, it's a big deal in Japan. Yeah, for sure. So, um, okay. They come down to this kind of stage area. There's some curtains and obviously a place where they would have done shows and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's a Theater. big boss that you fight here. Another Goliath class. Um, really interesting design, uh, clearly attempting to look feminine. Yeah. Um, this big, big poofy dress. Yeah. Almost operatic yeah. Uh, sort of like design to, uh, oh, to that's right. yeah, yeah. the garb and just everything about it. But then yep. um, she's also got some android bodies yeah, like as, decorated. As ornaments. Around, yeah, as ornaments on, on the costume. So yeah. kind of hanging on the headdress on either side is one. And then they've got, she's got like a whole bunch, like a belt kind of going around uh, the waist area. So tons of and, dead androids. And remember, the reason we're here is because there was some android group, um, yeah. the reconnaissance party or something like that, Black box that was things. around here. And they're saying, oh, we've lost contact with them. Right. So go find them. And then we see this massive robot that is wearing dead androids yep. as like decorations. Yep. Right. So it's like, okay, I think I know what happened to those people now. Yeah. Um, she's collecting them. She's yep. collecting androids. Right. And, uh, Every now and then you'll catch some of the words that she's saying. She's talking about being beautiful. Like I mm -hmm. must, I must be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I guess she wants, you know, us as some more Android ornaments. She wants uh, to use 9S and 2B to mm -hmm. continue to decorate her body. Yep. But uh, we don't let her. Um, yeah. And then like, like you said, uh, the name will come up for the boss and the level but it's yeah. just a bunch of symbols you can't really yeah. decipher at this point. You can 
if you get a little <laughs> Yoko Taro dictionary and like, what does this mean? But um, most people probably didn't do in, that. In the game, you're not meant to do that. You're, no, you're and, meant to do it on the second beat. Yes, through. and they, they just tell you what it is. So right. It's not really worth the time. So um, 9S says, our records don't say anything about a machine like this. Hmm. And she sort of laughs at you as she's fighting you, right? She's just like kind of laughing maniacally. Yeah. Um, later in the fight, she will try to hack you. So there's this this little sequence where it'll kind of go into this 3D uh, sort of geometric where, you, where you're like kind of a triangle, 3D triangle yeah, shape yeah. and you're shooting at these different things. Yep. Um, we'll get a lot more into hacking again in the second playthrough. But mm. <clears throat> this is like a defense against a hack attempt from the, the boss enemy on yeah. us. So you're taking like damage from this hacking. And so... Um, I think 9S says, it's trying to hack us. If we take hacking damage, it'll affect our bodies as well. So, you know, uh, Tubi is kind of limping after this. And so you have to kind of fight this off as part of the boss fight. Every once in a while, you'll like go into this hacking sort of like sequence mini game. Yeah. And then she's saying, of course, beautiful, beautiful. I must be beautiful. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to say this as a teaser or hint as to what we will be talking about with this boss later. The word beautiful in French is uh, bevois, be mm. bouvois, bevois, yeah. bouvois. Um, so just saying, like, keep to, an eye out for that. You know, <laughs> I think I think it would mean beau, beau, beau would be beautiful. Beauvoir, and yeah. then voix means to look or, or to, to see. see. Yeah. Yes. Right. So then beauvois. Beauvois. To, to look or to appear. So that will be discussed probably next time or maybe yeah. the time after. But Sounds good. Okay. So um, are we seriously being attacked by dead androids or with dead androids. Oh, that's right. Because at some point um, during the fight, all of a sudden, like the floor, like these passages open up in the floor and these like tons of dead android bodies, like Come crucified up. and impaled and just like <laughs> jacked, wrapped with barbed wire, just like yeah. wrapped around these poles, you know, just like slowly come up and you see there's like a hundred of them. It's absolutely tons. Yeah. Um, and at first you don't really know the point, but after a while, these androids start kind of waking up and start attacking <clears throat> start attacking us. And so we have to kind of fight off these androids, us being an android. So it's like a really awkward situation. So the boss here did not kill, completely kill the androids. More yeah. like reprogrammed them or put them to the brink of death, but allowed their op still operational bodies uh, in a combat sense to be activated, you know, uh, in accordance to like her own personal will. Right. So that's still going on, right? So then, mm -hmm. you know, as androids having to kill a bunch of your own people, which is, you can tell they're kind of having a hard time with it because they see all these dead android bodies and you would think, well, they're robots. They can get over it. It's fine. Um, but it's like it really affects them. Yeah. They're like, oh, my gosh, these are dead androids. Like, what? Wh who would do something like this? Yes. And then as humans playing, it's <laughs> you get this little grin on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because we're playing a game where you just yeah. kill a bunch of things, yeah. right? And it's like, uh, well, if I don't think that they're real, I, I would do that, you know? Because <laughs> I do it, because I'm playing this game. And this right. is where Yoko Taro kind of like pokes you a little bit. And he's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, yeah, you would do that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's also interesting, like, how much is being reinforced here that these androids do have a real capacity for emotion. They're very human-like. I mean, it, it's almost like humans that are trying real hard to not pay attention to their mm. feelings. Sure, yeah. But, or, or maybe that like are not not super in touch with their feelings yeah. for the most part. Right. But they do clearly have emotion. Yep. And they yep. are clearly affected by seeing things like this, yeah. right? And every now and then something just like, just triggers something in them that just kind of like makes them you know, become more emotional. Right. So wait, I don't think to be, I'm detecting black box signals. So these are yeah. the ones they came after. They yep. aren't dead. They've been turned into weapons. Yep. Um, so you keep fighting. Uh, and as the boss is dying, there's a quick flash to white where you see her oh. sort of extending her hand toward another machine. That's wearing kind of a hat a hat which we'll get to here in a second. Oh, great. Um, but it's just a real quick thing. You just see her kind of extending her hand, and there's another machine kind of extending hand back, and it's a machine wearing a hat, much shorter than her. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, we have to save those androids 
2B says at the end of the fight, and, and 9S says, I'm sorry, 2B, their circuits are fried. I think they were only kept alive by that enemy. So mm. she kept them alive just to use them as weapons. Yeah. Um, uh, and then as you're leaving, 9S says, that machine had some pretty weird things to say, huh? It's almost like it had actual emotion. Um, the machines don't have feelings, she yep. says back to him. You to said be, that yourself. Yep. And he says, yeah, I guess. Mm. And he's starting to question that. Right. And also, it just kind of starts bringing up this question, which I think I have a note later. I'll kind of return to this too. But this, um, it, there's almost like three layers to this, right? So they're so certain. No, like machines can't have feelings. They yeah. don't have feelings. Because it's what it's the assumption that has been like pre-programmed into them, right? Yeah, and so like, but what what is, what is it <laughs> to like actually be able to? How do you determine? Yeah. How do you even know? Yeah, whether or not the human being next to you feels yeah. an emotion, much less like you can't know that because right. I can't feel your feelings, right? No, this is yeah the the realm of the subjective, right? It's just uh, the only person that you can be sure of has feelings is yourself. Yeah. And you can never really prove it for right. anybody else. Or and especially so, consciousness, too. It's a yeah. similar problem. So how do you know whether or not a machine or something else, a plant, a whatever, something right. you would assume doesn't have emotions, can or cannot feel that? Right. Of course, we tend to link this with, like, the size of the brain, particularly, like, prefrontal mm, cortex yeah. and, like, higher thinking and uh, things like that. But um, there's, just, there's just so much we don't understand, I guess, or, or that we're not sure about with that. And so there, there, there's the layer of like, he doesn't think it's possible for machines, but like, we're also kind of on top of that as human beings, like can androids really have the human yeah. experience? Androids think, no, the machines can't have the human experience. So it, I don't know, there's just kind of an interesting thing they're building here. Yeah, they're like meta. starting to sort of set this up. And I, I like where it's going. I do too. Um, it's especially fascinating given the events of 2023, which will go down in history as the year that, uh, you know, well, artificial intelligence like finally got its feet off the ground. Yeah. And uh, I don't know exactly where this takes us, but you have these similar questions because like, how, how do I know you have feelings? Well, you tell me. Yeah. Or sure. I can observe it. Yeah. Right. I can observe that you exhibit behaviors that, that are you know, consistent Same with the behaviors I, ex I exhibit when I have those feelings. Therefore yeah. I can infer that you have those feelings or you just tell me, Hey, I'm feeling this way. Okay, great. I just believe <laughs> you, I guess. Yeah. Or I try to infer based on my own assumptions that the way you're acting implies that you have these, these feelings. Yeah. Um, but if we're talking about artificial intelligence or something and it's like, Oh, if I ask chat GPT, <laughs> what is it? Being beings, AI thing. If I say, Hey, are you sentient? And it tells me, yes, I am. I can write a program that says, I'm sentient, right? Yeah, I, but right. that doesn't mean it is, yeah, right? right? But but at what point does the the crappy little Python script that I wrote that's like seven lines, at what point is does that and then become, compared with this big AI thing, yeah. at what point does it actually become sentient? The answer may be never, but the fact is you you don't know that. No, no. And so at some point you do have to act. I, I I was listening to somebody not too long ago say that the in our lifetimes, assuming we live to be like a normal human age. Um, that a robot will stand trial mm. as a person, right? Or right. somebody will, as a defendant or a plaintiff, I don't, or, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know which one, but at some point, artificial intelligence will be like, there will be laws of mm -hmm. governing how you are allowed to treat AI. Yep. And that's like, that's weird. That's Isaac Asimov has some stuff like I, I robot has some stuff about that. There's it's, it's probably going to happen. Um, but I love it that this game and also the movie we're going to be talking about today on Patreon does have some implications mm. for Jurassic Park, by the way, um, has implications for like when technology, like, you know, I don't know when um, either maybe when you've gone too far or when you are introducing stuff that's just unnatural to humans and you're trying yeah. to fit a round peg into a square hole and say that trying to you control now something that yeah this thing that's never been alive to you. Like it's possible in our lifetimes that we play a video game where the video game characters are actually sentient alive. and we can't just kill them. <laughs> right. It's like illegal to just go in and kill them in the video game. Yeah. Right. Because they're, they're considered alive. 
that that's wild. I can't even really conceive of a world like that, but it very well may be approaching. Yeah. It's just crazy. Um, so this game's like, I don't know. It's, there's a it's great coming at the right time. Star Trek, the next generation episode, season two, measure of a man. Oh, that I've goes heard all of this. over this. I've it's heard all of about, this episode. Uh, it's, it's like the first truly profoundly outstanding Star Trek The Next Generation episode yeah. where it's just like, wow, like that was like that, that hits like really hard. And it's uh, with the robot dude, right? Data. Um, Data. Yeah. That's his mm. name. Yeah. Data stands yeah. trial on whether or not he's alive or not, basically, like whether he's the property of Starfleet and can be brought in and have his, uh, his brain like right. taken apart and studied whether or whether he has ethical. rights to say no. I don't. Mm. I don't cons uh, consent to that. Yeah. And like, it's fascinating. It's a great episode. Really, really good. That's why. Uh, goes along really well with some of the stuff we're talking about. But yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, we'll be returning to this topic. Okay. So you come outside of the stage area you're in, and there's a machine waving a, a white flag <laughs> mm. out there, just waving it, and it's, hostiles. No, I'm not hostile. <laughs> He says, waving his flag, you defeated the broken machine. You saved us. This yep. thing is awfully verbose for a machine. That's right. This uh, is like the first machine we've met that like speaks in just pretty perfect normally. normal yeah. English. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, he says, we repay you. Come to our village. And so you follow it to the machine village. This is an area we will be coming back to uh, many, many times throughout yeah. the game. So there's a whole village of machines that are not hostile, they're, they're completely passive, yep. um, have no desire whatsoever to fight or uh, participate in any violence whatsoever. And they're all kind of like waving white flags yeah, as when we you keep come in, going in, yeah. They're all waving white flags, I love it, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so their leader is a character named Pascal, yeah. of course after uh, Blaise Pascal, the yep. philosopher um, who I have been reading Pense, which nice. is, um, we talked about That's this a little cool. bit in the first episode, but this was not necessarily like a, a completed work by him. It was more of a collection of his notes that were going to be used for a book he wanted oh, to write okay, that he okay. never really got around to. Mm. So as you're reading it, it's like literally just like lists of kind of just ideas. So it's just almost like a That's stream cool. of consciousness. Like, here's an idea I have. He, he doesn't make any arguments for it. He just right. like puts it down. Um, and, and they're like numbered. So it's like note number one, two, three, four, kind of a thing. Right? I, have a, I have a Google Doc like that. Yeah. It's, like, it's, like <laughs> it's, basically, pages. it's basically Pascal's <laughs> Google Doc for his, uh, his, like his personal, notes that's for funny. a book he wanted to write. Cool. So anyway, I've been reading some of that um, in, in preparation. I think there's some pretty interesting things from what I've read that apply to some of the things that go on here in the village. So um, 9S is all concerned that this is a trap of some kind. You know, uh, he's very wary about it. You know, we can't trust them. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. Oh, actually, I skipped something. So, no. on your way to the village, like kind of as you're traversing there into the trees, Tubi stops and takes note of these rockets that are kind of just like flying oh, up yeah, in the distance. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And she's like, what's that? Right? Yeah. And uh, Nina says, oh, right, you wouldn't have seen that before. They're sending supplies up uh, from Earth to the moon and the bunker. So mm. the, re the resistance androids here on the planet yeah. have a place where they continually send supplies right. up to the yeah. humans on the moon and to the androids on the bunker. So that's how they're able to survive there, right? We were kind of talking about this last time, like, you know, what kind of resources can they actually get living on the moon for thousands of years? Right. The answer is probably not many. Probably we not we talked about, you know, maybe, uh, you know, certain metals and things yeah, that could be found be there, but uh, certainly not uh, enough to survive for thousands of years. So these androids are sending supplies to them to keep them alive. Yeah. So that's uh, something to keep a note of. And, and remember, whenever you see this, wh whether it's a movie or a game or whatever, they take a moment to stop you and like point something out. Yeah. That's something you're supposed to remember for later. This is a setup mm -hmm. for something. This is important. Cool. So that's one of the, this is one of those instances. So I wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Perfect. Okay. So Pascal meets you at the entrance. Uh, before we begin, there's something you must understand. We are not your enemies. To be, we can't trust anything machines say. I understand that you see us as enemies, but well, anyway, my name is Pascal. I'm the leader of this village. 
Those who reside here desire nothing more than to live a peaceful existence. Look around for yourself. You'll see that it's true. So you can kind of go around talking to them, learning about them. Um, there's a couple of pretty interesting side quests you can start here. The one in particular that um, I wanted to talk about was a little side quest called uh, Jean-Paul's Melancholy. This <laughs> is... Yeah, this a response great. to Jean-Paul so uh, Sartre, Sartre <laughs> um, the philosopher, uh, who is also a big sort of, we, we talked about him, of course, in, in the first episode as well. Mm. So there's a machine with a hat. It's kind of how it, you distinguish him from the others. Remember back to the white flash we got with yeah. the boss reaching out to the other machine with a hat. Same silhouette, same guy, right? So, um, you talk to him. He says, wait, do not tell me. I have already deduced that you are here to listen to me expound upon the great mysteries of existence. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> well enough. Let us begin by discussing the concept of existentialism. Essence and existence are two sides of the same coin. And yet, what is existence? I'm glad you asked, which they didn't, to answer mm -hmm. that will require many long hours of, and then Tubi's just like, this is pointless. This is, yeah. Why are we talking to this guy? Um, so there's a bell-like machine close by who gives some context for this guy. All he does is spout a bunch of mumbo jumbo about something mm -hmm. called philosophy. If you're curious about him, you'll have better luck talking to his followers. They tend to use smaller words at least. Um, and then Nina says, this guy has followers. <laughs> and the, the machine says more like fans, I suppose. But yes, right. there are quite a few out there, uh, who buy what he's selling. Don't ask me why some folks get into that sort of thing. I suppose there's even one Jean Paul follower right here in this village. You might know the machine with the thick paint on her face. That's the one. Yeah. So there's a machine here with makeup that you go and talk to. Yeah. And, uh, she talks about, Oh, he's the greatest thing yep. ever. I love him so much. And I can't let those other uh, girls like get to him first. Like you got to take my letter to him and let him know how I feel. So the quest is basically to go find these uh, her and then these other two fans or more like admirers yeah. right, um, of Jean Paul and deliver gifts to him on their behalf. Um, so there's one in the amusement park. There's another one in the desert. They all give you something. You take it to him, and he more or less just like totally dismisses them yes. as being worthless or junk <laughs> or there, pointless. There is something about the actual Jean Paul Sartre that yes. this is similar to. This kind yes. of parallels. Like there were, there were. He he was a funny kind of guy, and there were people around him, and he was not always faithful to the women that he was with, and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, he was in an open relationship yes. with uh simone de Beauvoir. so yes and they were he was famously jealous of that. exactly yeah. exactly that's more or less my point uh, yeah. but also he anyways they they both kind of uh, did their own things people were always trying to get his attention and uh yes well he was funny about it yes so the machine here jean paul is rude in his dismissal <laughs> and you're like well i guess we should take the bad news to yep well, no, it's uh, the way he dismisses it is so good, though. Yeah. I have to find the exact uh, part here. So, 9S tells uh, Sartre that he should respond to the letter, yeah. right? So, saying essentially, like, he's like, oh, well, I don't, I'm not going to respond. Like, oh, darn. But Sartre then says, <coughs> is one duty bound to respond? <laughs> if such is your claim, then what power was it? <laughs> who placed this burdensome yoke about my neck. He's all being all dramatic about it, you know, and waxing poetic at this, yeah. this imposition of, of humanity. It. Like, so basically trying to make some kind of like larger philosophical argument about, yes. you're telling me that I have a, some sort of responsibility to respond. Yeah. Well, do you, well, why don't you, the burden of proof is on you now. Why don't exactly. you tell me why that's my <laughs> prove to me? Cause that, but that's what happens when you use the word should, right? Yeah. So basically there is no should, without God or some, yes. th there is no should without an enforcement <laughs> or without yes. a, a, a thing that is doing the imposing, right? So um, in God's absence, how can anyone say that one should do anything? Yes. And that's more or less his point, yes. right? And it's, it's hilarious because 
you know, he, he feels this yoke, but he's, he's, you know, trying to exemplify Sartre here a little bit. And yeah. of course, Sartre being the existentialist says that you choose, you choose your own destiny. Right. So anybody who comes up and tells you anything, you have to like backhand him and be like, <laughs> I'm in charge here. And I, what I really like about this is that, um, Yoko Taro, he does this a lot, but he'll introduce you to a character. He'll introduce you to some philosophy surrounding yeah. this character. And then he'll kind of like undercut the philosophy, yep. <laughs> right? Like he presents it as a thesis. Then he gives you like an antithesis that, that just kind of like undercuts the original thesis just like right away. And yeah. it's just like, oh, okay, this is Sartre's weakness. <laughs> okay, I get it now, right? Yeah, right. Anyways, it's really funny. But I love that Yoko Taro does that because he, you, and, and this is why it's so difficult to determine what his message is for the game, right? Because each time he gives you some philosophy of life and existence, he kind of like shows you the underside of it as well. Yes. And then he moves on to a new one. Yes. And then he exposes that one yes. as being, and that he's, essentially there's no like one true perfect philosophy for how to live a great life. Right. That's more or less what he's saying. Yes. Um, but the way he does it is just genius. It's yeah. really, really good. I, um, I had a lot of thoughts about this, and in particular because I was reading uh, Pense um, while I was kind of playing through this section. But there is one quote from Pascal in the book that, I, that really made a lot of things about Yoko Taro make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, you know, we were talking about how he's a, he's a confounding sort of figure. It's hard to really know when he's joking and when he's being serious or if he's ever being serious. Like or... famously in episode one, I show a clip that I was sure was Yoko Taro taking off his mask <laughs> because why wouldn't it be? And it turns out <laughs> that he often will give his mask to other people and have them take off the helmet as though they were him. Yes, but it's and not really He's him. just playing a joke. Yes. It's, it's ridiculous. Crazy. It's really hard to follow. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and I was reading this quote and I feel like it really put together for me why he does what he does. Okay. So the quote reads, to make light of philosophy is to be a true philosopher. I think Beautiful. another translation of that is ridicule of philosophy is really philosophy. Oh, nice. Well, that's something that Nietzsche would do. In yes. fact, Nietzsche specifically towards like Kant and towards other philosophers of his day, he was just brutal to them. <laughs> he was just yes. like, these guys, these guys are just like petty and they're, they've got their little squabbles and their, their writings are useless and they write a whole book, but don't say anything. Yes. And like Nietzsche was really, he exemplified that I think, yes. pretty well. And well, let me read another quote from the book too, because this is, this to me is the reason why philosophy is meaningful to us. It's the yeah. reason why. Um, it's important, but at the same time, there's a perspective you need to keep yeah. um, when you get really deep into sort of this intellectual state of mind. Um, basically, yeah. the entire first chapter of Pense is all about Pascal talking about the, in, the intuition versus like the mathematical mind, right? Mm. That leaning too heavily on one side or the other um, which kind of all comes back to the Eastern yin yang thing. Right? Of course. Yep. It, it means that you're not really going to live a fulfilled life. You're not really going to under, you're not really going to have true wisdom or understanding yeah, yep. if you're too mathematical about things or if you're just too intuitive about everything. Yeah. That's basically his whole point. He's kind of going back and forth on, but there's, there's something here that I really loved and that I think really touches on kind of what we are trying to do with our channel. Well, like we had a whole rebranding for those who weren't around when we were called Dark yeah, Pixel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, We changed from Dark Pixel to Resonant Arc. And the whole, I guess, philosophy behind that name was to find in within the arc, the, within the storytelling arc, within right. stories, what it is that resonates with people and yeah. then articulate that in a way in which helps the viewer deepen their appreciation that already exists yeah. for the work. Yeah. It's meant to help idea. people connect even more with something that they love. And here it's written, when a natural discourse paints a passion or an effect, one feels within oneself the truth of what one reads, which mm. was there before, although one did not yeah. know it. Yes. Hence, one is inclined to love him who makes us feel it, for he has not shown us his own riches, but ours. And thus the benefit yeah. renders him pleasing to us. Uh, besides that, such community of intellect 
as we, well, I won't read the rest of that. I think the most important part is, hence one is inclined to love him who makes us feel it, for he has not shown us his riches but ours. Yeah. The yeah. idea is that there is something intuitive in the philosophical principle being presented that right. we go, it's, it's like you knew it all along, but you, you yeah. sort of... You just sort of realize that you knew it all along. And this right? person was like the, the guide yeah. that helped you to realize this thing right. that you already knew. That And Plato, Plato talked about this a lot yeah. because he felt like uh, all learning, all knowledge was essentially memory. Yes. And I feel like he was, he's talking about something like this, right? Where when yes. you discover something, there's a sense that you already knew it. Yes. To begin with the whole time. You, right. just, you just couldn't, you didn't have the words for it. You didn't, know how, you didn't know how to articulate it. Right. And this is what I felt about philosophers um, for a little while now is that they just tell you what you already know. What you already know. Right. So you already know it. They just tell it to you. Yes. They're like to be or not to be or, or <laughs> like, uh, oh, I think therefore I am. Like, what is he even saying? Like, we right. all know that we exist. Right. Why is Descartes, why is it so profound that he found this like way of, oh, you know you exist because you think, therefore that's how you know you exist. Yes. But it's like, but I already knew I existed, right? Right. But at the same time, when people can reframe and give you a different perspective on something you already know, it yes. just deepens your knowledge of that thing, right? right? So it's still helpful. But at the same time, you know, it's like you, you did already know that. I, I often, like sometimes I'll talk to my mom or my wife or I'll talk to people about things that I think are really deep and they'll be like, oh, I already knew that. I'm like, yes. yeah, I know, I know, I know you know that. I know this, <laughs> but I'm telling you why you know that. I'm trying to explain to you the intricacies of how you yes. can even know that, right. how, how knowledge is even possible. Yes, right, <laughs> right, right. It's just funny because some people just, they don't care. And it's like, in a way that they're totally right. You know, like yes. they don't need to know all this stuff. They're already acting it yes. out. Like, That's, what's the point of me coming in with my with my uh, thinking and my talking and my words and my, my nerdy <laughs> books? And, and it's just to, to tell them stuff they already know. Right. I think that's a really good point to lead into kind of the second part of why I love this side quest so much. Yeah. Because um, if, if you're looking at it that way, if you are as the philosopher looking at it as I am not uh, creating, you know, like inventing these mm. profound concepts and uh, right. enlightening everyone right. else around me. Yeah. Right then, and you understand it from here, then you can do what was said here in principle one to make light of philosophy is to be a true philosopher. You need to have a go, level of humility because hmm. there is no like objective truth in philosophy, generally speaking. It's just yeah. concepts that feel intuitively right to us, right, or not, depending on whether you resonate with that philosophy or not. But it, there, it, a lot of these things are unprovable yeah. concepts, right? Yeah, you totally. can't test them. Yes. So th I, it, I it's just not... finished reading Kant today, and that is exactly what he's talking about. Yes. Yeah. So, but as somebody who begins to have followers, right? Somebody who begins to have people yeah. who, as this says here, one is inclined to love him who makes us feel it, Right even though he has not shown us his own riches, but ours. That's yeah. why they love him right. for saying it, because he's helped us awaken something we already knew or already felt, but in a way that deepens our appreciation for that thing we knew. Okay, but the, it can go to the head of the person who has the followers now, and they can start to believe, oh, I invented this, I created of course, this. Of course, of uh, course. You know, it this, is me, this did not me. come from the collective unconscious, this came from myself. Yes, yeah. I am I'm a genius. Special. I'm the chosen one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So when you start taking yourself too seriously, <laughs> this can tend to happen. And yeah. this becomes the problem, right? Um, because... It's, and, and this is what I love about this original quote. To make light of philosophy is to be a true philosopher. You cannot take this stuff too seriously. It is untestable. It is really <laughs> unknowable. And nobody yeah. really knows what the fetch they're talking about. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We're all, we're all blindly, uh, the blind leading the blind, you know? Yes. It's like a bunch of uh, people trying to feel their way through a cave. And it's just like, oh, I think I figured something out. And yes. it's like no one actually knows the terrain. No. Nobody has it mapped out at all. And it can seem like that, and you can really let it get to your head that you think right. you've got it figured out and you know what you're talking about. Yeah. But in reality, nobody really does. And Probably in a few not. hundred years, there's going to be someone who comes around, yeah. if you were, say, the, the, the genius of your time, and they'll show you how freaking wrong you were about uh, <laughs> so many things. 
And it happens all the time. And no matter how scientific you think you are, you will you are going to be shocked at <laughs> how wrong at how wrong our cur- what we know today is in a hundred years. Yes, and just all the arguments you're having about provable and this and that, like it, it, most of both sides are just going to be wrong in the end. Yes, and so it's like kind of petty, right? Yes. Like what are you doing here? And that's and why s- laughing at it or making light of it or making fun of it, yes, is like a, a good option, right? Don't take it too seriously. This is something that I have. Um, really struggled with throughout my life. I have tended to take myself way too seriously. Mm. I get very easily embarrassed. I, and this is a a reason why I tend to be very like standoffish. I don't like to be in the spotlight in like social situations. I tend to say or do something and then, and then I'll get really, um, you know, like, Oh, like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? And it's because I am not understanding this principle. You need to be able to take yourself, to make light of yourself. Yeah. um, In order to be a true philosopher. Because what I've noticed, and I think what he's poking at here with Jean Paul. Yeah. This dude took himself. The the copyright pig. Way too seriously. Yeah. Right? And when you do that, you, you tend to really lose touch with being able to have like real connections with people. Mm, like, oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. And, and you, yeah. you were kind of ta- yeah. what you were saying about, you know, your mom and, and people yes. you're trying to communicate with. It's like they're not you're yeah. not able because you're just so in this mindset of like taking this stuff so seriously yeah. that you start to kind of lose touch yep. with like the people around you and what's like normal <laughs> sort of like uh, behavior or ways yeah. of uh, interacting or communicating yes. with people. And you can, you yes. can really start to lose touch of that if, you, if you're taking yourself just way too seriously all the time. And so I think what Yoko Taro does in his interviews, what he does with just this quirky, crazy yeah, behavior yeah. that he does is he's trying never to take himself too seriously because that's yeah. the mark of a true philosopher, someone who Good. can comment on these on this stuff mm. who understands it who reads it who is educated but who doesn't ever assume they really know what they're talking about well that that's, that's a very good point the balance yeah. that is important to find and i i sort of when i read that this struck me yeah. in a way to where it was like okay i've got to work on this like mm. <laughs> particularly the last few years on this podcast I've started to get more and more and more locked in, dialed in, very serious about this stuff I'm reading. And it's like, you can't, you're, you got to like not go much further that direction or else you're going to get, you're going to become Jean Paul, the machine from this village. Right. And and you you can't let that happen because you kind of lose, like I said, you lose touch. You lose touch, but you might gain a few hardcore followers. (laughs) Some, some, you know, sure. So I loved this quest because it 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 sort of, it sort of really points that out in a really simple way, but in a way that's also pretty profound. So, you know, you, you go back and you deliver this bad news to these machines. That's right. And for the most part, they're like, Oh, that's awesome. I knew he would say that. I knew. Isn't he a genius? Isn't he great? They're all just like eating it (laughs) up. It's so funny. (laughs) It's it's so funny. It's not at all. I laughed out loud when I, when, after her response, because I was like, this is just hilarious like they really they really have this like connection where they really do understand each other but they're so separate from everyone else right they're just completely on their own but there's this funny way in which they're connected but they're connected through this repudiation of the imposition that connections are good or bad or that anything is moral or that anything like ought to be done or not right so there is no but they're bound together by the fact that like there's nothing binding them together yes it's the weirdest thing yes it makes almost makes no sense but in this world right like anybody can what is it anything you you can make things meaningful yes that other people just can't see and that doesn't mean they aren't meaningful it just yes. means that well it's in, in in part as i'm talking more through this it is kind of a confirmation of jean paul sartre's <laughs> like ideas of existentialism sure right? yeah because she found great meaning in his refusal to talk to her yes and and who are we to say that, <laughs> that was who are we to say? a meaningful thing to do and and that jean paul sartre or sorry that jean paul uh, made the wrong choice in not responding and not being uh, kind. Yes. Right? And it's so funny. But like, uh, and, and this is kind of just like the last point I want to hit on here is it, 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 
um, makes you lose touch when you be become like this serious about philosophy. It, yeah. it, it, it lose touch in such a way to where someone can say, you ought to respond to them, don't you think? Right. And and your response to that is to debate that. <laughs> Whether or not ought is even a proper word. Right. You know? It's where, like, dude, where does the ought come the from? The world is not a courtroom, dude. This is not, right. every situation yeah. does not, it needs not be turned into a freaking yeah. debate club. <laughs> you funny. understand what the person means when they say that. We right. don't have to like, Get, Ar argue what, semantics all the time. Yes, yeah. and, and this this kind of drives me crazy about <laughs> very specific people. Yeah. When they're asked a question, I, I, people will probably know who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to bring up the name. <laughs> Don't say it. Do you believe in God? <laughs> oh, what do you mean, do I believe in God? Like, dude, you know what they mean. <laughs> Stop taking yourself so damn seriously, man. <laughs> Calm down. Have a normal conversation. <laughs> Do you oh, believe in God or not? <laughs> Have a real conversation with someone, right? Oh, that's hilarious. So oh, that's, that's what I mean is oh, like, and that, I feel like that's what Tara's doing. I don't think any of this is done in bad faith or like in the sense of like, um, you know, uh, you know, trying to tear somebody down as much as we need to be able to make light of each other. We need yeah. to be able to poke fun at each other and, 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 uh, you know, our, our balloon heads need to be loosened yeah. a little bit of the, <laughs> the air that's being filled in them. And we need to be able to laugh at ourselves and, and, be, and realize that's okay to, to look foolish sometimes because you're just, you're taking yourself way too seriously, man. Like, calm down. You know? I, I totally agree. It's really I totally important. Agree. So, oh, man, that's good. That was okay. very well put. <laughs> okay. I have something else, though, that we kind of skipped over. I didn't realize. Okay. Um, and I, I can't remember exactly when this happens, but um, as they're watching these rockets be shot up towards the space station, it was either 2B or 9S. Somebody brings up, why don't the aliens just attack the bunker directly? Yes. Or attack the moon directly? They came from outer space. They presumably can navigate space. And why, why is the fighting here on Earth? Why yes. isn't it up there? Right. And there's really no answer to that, at least not in root a yes <laughs> <laughs> but um like that is the question like what's going on here there's a paradox happening here where aliens invade and we're safe in space not earth that makes no sense right yes. so that's a really right. important thing to kind of yes. just point out right um also i had some notes on pascal but i actually think that you uh i think you covered pascal better than i did here the only point here is uh within that book um, something that we haven't yet touched on, but within the book, talking about imagination, yes, right, mm -hmm. and how imagination is where the future comes from, right? That's how yep. this all exists. But it, and Pascal says, it so often like leads you astray, yes, and it can so often be your downfall. Right. Is this imaginative, you know, aspect of human of humankind? Um, and so, given that the character's name is Pascal, and that's one of the big sections of the book that Yoko Taro recommended that he said was in his toilet. <laughs> <laughs> In the bathroom, right, whatever he meant. Um, that I think that's really good. So Pascal is someone, uh, somewhat of an imaginative kind of person. You can yes. think of the the John Lennon song. If I, what was that? What is it? Um, if if only what was it? Imagine, imagine. Oh right? yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyways, this idea, the the ideal, right? And he's got this peaceful society along the lines of like John Lennon, where it's like we're all getting along. Every, we got the white flags. There's no fighting. Everything's great. We're right. all we're all doing well. It's a bit of a of a society that can't exist, but here it is. Yes. Right. And right. and then Pascal, you know, bringing his imagination to life through this village. Um, and it's something that we're just going to probably return to a little bit later yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. I also got the feeling that this was like Ewok Village, but full of robots. Yes. Right? Everything about it in the trees and the way they were all acting and yeah. how they're all like kind of short and yeah, like kind of big. Right. And like, it's like the bunch of Ewoks, yeah. except they're robots. I thought that was so good. Yeah, it's awesome. And then, um, of course... Existence precedes essence. Yep, which is a what direct, the robot talks about. Call out to existentialism. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, if if humans out. were not created for a purpose, there's no underlying essence to humanity. Each can decide what their essence is idiosyncratically. But I did want to bring up something here since uh, since this Jean Paul dude brought it up. Um, that the the idea that Freud and Jung and Levi Strauss and some of maybe the less philosophical, but more like psychological or anthropological people would, would totally disagree with that because yeah. like Jung's whole theory of the collective unconscious is that there's something 
there's an essence that unites all of humans, yes, right? Right. And then that's like his whole theory. Yes. <laughs> right? right. So, and same thing with Freud when he yeah. talks about the id and and uh, the superego and how everything kind of works, right, within the subconscious mind and and dreams and what things mean. Especially in Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, he says that when when you see a thing and when you see a thing, it means the same thing. Your mind is just kind of veiling it, yes, right? right? So anyways, the idea that there is an essence is something that like Levi Strauss and all of the anthropologists and psychologists would, uh, and even to the point where he talks about like you can't grow wings. Yeah, right? yeah, right. But that is a limit, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, ev- and I know why he says that because it's like, okay, obviously there are some things. Okay, then, then there is an essence to humans, right? Yes, sure. Okay, but, but, <laughs> but, but Sartre's point is that it's not absolute, right? Yeah. It's not 100%. It's more like He's, the purpose yes. of your life is not, and there's no essence to the purpose of your life. Or something to, like that. That would make sense. your reason for living. Except for you can do it negatively, though. You can say, well, humans can't fulfill this purpose right well okay sure fine. then through negative you know you can negate a bunch of things and get narrow something it, out of that but down. you can't give a positive statement sure right at least in the absence of God, it is this. the way you can say starts. what it's not but not yes. necessarily what it is yeah that's more or less the point there yeah um and then camus i love this too because in my research about sartre um i came up across this squabble between camus and sartre <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny it's so good because um sartre talks about um you know, uh, you can find your own meaning. He's more existentialist, right? Camus wrestled with existentialism, but ultimately settled on absurdism, which is so yeah. funny because Sartre is saying like, oh, you can, you know, there, there is the concept of meaning still exists. You just need to go out and find it. And then Camus says, no, the idea of meaning, period, is absurd. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like the idea that anything could be meaningful is yeah. just stupid. And yeah. so um, Camus and Sartre had this like split up over yeah. that. Like they kind of got all upset at each other. And yeah. Anyways, I just thought that was super, super funny. There was a great quote. Uh, on our video. I don't know if you saw this. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> the, I was the thinking Giga of Giga Chad, uh, Camus, <laughs> Camus versus the literal cuck Sartre. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was in an open relationship. People. Well, that's what he would say. <laughs> right? But anyway, it was just funny. Oh, it was a really good funny. laugh out of that one. It was very funny. You got to take these comment. philosophers lightly. You got to right? make light of it. That's the, the, that's true philosophy, right? Um, anyway, so okay. yeah, good stuff. Any more? Nope, nope. I'm okay. I'm caught up now. So the only last thing about this is when you get back to the village after all this, Jean Paul is gone and he's left a oh, note right. saying that he's gone out to find um, truth in the world. Of course, I've I've left to seek truth of the world. Throw that trash away. <laughs> uh, okay. So he's gone, and uh, we'll encounter him or news of him later. Yep. So leave that for now. Um, okay. Operator. My note is like leaving. Yes, the operator. Oh, this is so funny. Says to 2B, time for your regularly scheduled contact. <laughs> She's like crying. <laughs> 2B here, what's oh, wrong? This game is so good. Oh, there's this operator I kind of liked, but when I asked her out, she turned me down. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, 2B, I don't think I know if I'm sp- how I'm supposed to go on living. Um, and then she says, uh, Tubi says, I'm definitely not the person to discuss this with. <laughs> She's like the most stoic, <laughs> like uh, completely emotionless. Well, on the on her face, completely emotionless kind of person. Yeah. And it's that's just hilarious that the operator's going to her. Yeah. And the, I don't think I can stand spending one more day in this bunker. And then Tubi says, your leaving would be bad for me. It would affect the mission or affect mission efficiency. <laughs> Are you saying you need me to be? <laughs> so good. <laughs> That's so good. And then she says, all Model B combat units require assistance from oh, an operator. No. So, to be. <laughs> That's all. Closing this channel. It's <laughs> so good, good stuff. She gave her a purpose to live. Yep. It was great. That's so Loved funny. It. I absolutely Really, love it. really good. She sends an email, too, um, a little bit later on. Did you get the email? I don't think I remember reading that. Oh, it was so funny because she's like, hey, thanks for talking to me. <laughs> like, things are good, you know. Um, you know, here's she just gives her, like, some general info. But she also, okay, we haven't talked much about the emails, though, but the emails are really interesting. Yes. Um, because you can kind of follow some characters through email. They'll email you stuff, specifically the operator. Yeah. And she sent us, like, this Zodiac or the Jupiter. What was it? Depending on the size of the storm, the eye of Jupiter, Mm -hmm. that like it affects people on earth. And like if, if the eye is doing certain things or there's different electrical, like uh, electromagnetic functions on Jupiter, then it affects the androids like in outer space. But it's this like horoscope kind of like a, 
uh, an astrology kind of thing that the androids are all like super into. So she'll email you like, oh, I figured this out about me. Oh, great. And then an email later, it's like, oh, I ditched that crap. That's nonsense. <laughs> like that was just like hocus pocus. It doesn't work. And, like, But I think the idea also is that even looking out into the stars, these androids are trying to find meaning, right? Yeah, They're latching right. onto things, right? right it's right. really, really cool. Yeah. Um, but she talks about how, okay, she's going to get over this uh, person that rejected her. Um, and in her email, she says, I'll forge my own destiny all on my own. That's the true desire of every your ha woman anyways, right? And then dot, dot, dot with like a crying face emoji. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's so good because like it's so, it's so, in, it's so good. It's a good thing to say, like forge your own destiny, yeah. go for it, make your own meaning, like find your purpose in life. And then the reality sets in where it's like, that's not easy at all. In fact, that might be the hardest thing to do anywhere ever. Sure. And that's why it's so difficult uh, for people who are, are, you know, who hold on to meaning in a certain way. And if you come to like kind of uh, persuade them that that's wrong, or if you come to take away what they have, you're ruining like their foundation of life, Mm -hmm. right? Like it's... It's really because now they have to, they can't just float in space. They need to ground on something. So, but now they have to make it themselves. Yeah. Like, right. thanks, dude. Thanks for that. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll just like get a hammer and nail and start making a new thing now. But yeah. it's like your own, anyways. Um, I thought it was really good. That crying face emoji at the it's end so is funny. like, yeah, she's not, she's not, she's going to find another thing that makes her oh, happy. Oh, man. Okay. So, when you get back to the resistance camp, uh, an anemone confirms um, that they've been trading with Pascal's village of machines for like a while. So no, this that's has been right, something yeah. that's been going on for some time. Kind um, of under, oh, yeah, what would you say, black well, market well, like? Yeah, like, well, they certainly wouldn't want Yorha to know this. Right, yeah. Right? What's so, the word? Under under something? Under the table maybe? Yeah, Anyways. like in secret. They're, they're, in they're, secret. They've been doing this. Um, but yeah, like Yorha does not know about yeah. it, right? So kind of interesting. The Again, the... The re- the early androids, the the Earth dwelling androids, the Resistance androids, much more lax uh, in terms of their attitude yeah. about the mission and its urgency, totally, and that sort of thing, right? And like, yeah, I've been here before and done this a thousand times. Yeah, yeah. like you can wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So whereas two B, this is her first time on Earth. Yeah, right? I don't right. think I don't no, know if we no, mentioned that's that. That's what Nine S was saying. Yeah. when 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 she saw like, the oh, rockets. Oh yeah, you wouldn't know that. Yeah, this is her first time coming down. So. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. Also, Nine S tells Pascal that his mouth can say whatever it wants, but he still doesn't have a heart. Right. Yeah, I remember that line too. Too yeah. good. Too good. Uh, an, uh, an attempt to other the machines, yes. right? Which is, he's been trying to do this whole time. Like, oh, no, gosh. they're not like us. No, they don't understand yeah. what they're doing. No, I othering, 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 yeah. othering. And this kind of plays back into the whole thing we talked about with the Coca-Cola ad and the, yes. the Pakistanis Pakistan, and, India. The, and the Indians, right? And the, and the conflict they have. And, yeah. You know, trying to reframe that the way that they did. Well, because uh, you could imagine that before they could talk, he would say like, oh, they... You know, it's all just random, but they definitely can't talk, right? Now they yeah. can talk. Okay, well, your mouth can say what it wants to be down the heart. And as soon as you find the heart, well, it's like, okay, you have a heart, but you definitely don't have uh, like a spirit or soul a conscience or, or a yeah. soul. Yeah. Okay, fine. You have a soul, but you you still don't have like the proper something. Like, but there you're will, not human. There could always whatever. be yeah. something, yes. right? You can you, you can always insert something. An infinite there. number of ways yes. you could other somebody. Yes. And and at the at, at what point are you finally just yeah. going to say? Okay fine. okay, fine. I accept you yeah. like as you are and, and, and you should be treated with respect just like me. And the answer to that is at whatever point you decide. Yeah. It could be early on. It could be before you find out that they can speak English. Right. <laughs> right. It could be, it could have been from the very beginning, but it's all up to you as yeah. to when you accept them. It's not incumbent on them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I guess the idea would be like, it's silly to keep pushing that or to keep moving those goalposts further and further back. Like, yes. <laughs> it's, it's better to just obviously like accept, uh, a, a people, uh, yeah. that are other from you <laughs> yeah. earlier on. Right. Um, okay. So you call back into Pascal. She says, anemone is so kind and understanding. If only all androids and machines could live together like this, never going to happen. Uh, I guess not. I'd appreciate it if you could help out with some of the machines as well, though. Uh, after all, the only way to understand someone is to get to know them. Isn't mm, that right. right? I love that line. Again, very yeah. simple. Something I think everybody understands sure, and knows already. But in light of, I, I would say, social issues happening around us all the time, 
Mm-hmm. And this is something we talked about in episode one quite a lot. It's like, go talk to those people, dude. Right, go talk yeah. to those people you're othering. Go talk to the yeah. people that you are afraid of and find out what it's what they're really like, you know? Because the idea is that you think you understand them already. Yes. You think, without oh, I don't ever need to talk to them. There, yes. Without ever having any real connection I with their I already culture. know. But the idea being, I was told, right. secondhand, thirdhand, whatever. So I understand it. I read it in a book. Somebody you know, informed me of this. I know it's like, no dude, just actually go there. Right. Actually experience it. Actually talk to them. Make your own connection with this other culture. It it should, I don't know. Sometimes there's like a cost prohibitive thing there, Yeah. but you can always go walk somewhere. I don't know. Just go walk around and meet people. There's people all around. Exactly. To be, this is an emergency transmission from the bunker. We're reading a Goliath class enemy inside the city ruins. And it also looks like, there are a ton of other machines there with it. All Yorha units are uh, should proceed and engage immediately. So all Yorha units means I, us. Yes, it means <laughs> go people. kill this thing. Um, yes, of course. But uh, the game goes black and white here. Did you notice this? Oh, like, did I? During this whole battle with this particular Goliath class in the city, like the whole game remember. goes black and white, and then after this is over, it goes back to color that. again. And I was <laughs> trying to, I was trying to think for the life of me, like why. Did we go black and white here? I don't get it. When uh, we're doing the specific stuff that Yorha tells us to do. Yeah. Oh, but I do know that when your health is low, it's black and white. Yeah, that I means. <laughs> and, and you touched on that happened. earlier too, where yeah, it's like the world when you're becomes, in survival mode, yeah. the world becomes black, and, black white. and white. It's just about surviving. Yeah. And when you're, when you have more leisure, when you have, yeah. when your security is assured, mm-hmm. you have more room to explore the nuances of life and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But it, I just found it interesting that, like, the first time we fought this Goliath class in the, yeah, in the opening wasn't. chapter. That's right. Yeah. It, it didn't go black and white. So mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily related to the Goliath itself. But something happens here yeah. where, hmm. and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I was, I was interested if you had thoughts or if people in the comments have thoughts on why this particular section goes black and white in that relation to, to this idea we've already brought up that right. we're into this locked in militaristic locked in, yep. black and white, seeing the world as enemy, yeah, uh, good bad. ally, good yeah. and evil sort of dichotomy. Um, why this particular boss fight? I, I couldn't quite. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear what people figure say. out why. But it does do hmm. that. It's like as soon as you get this call, and it's not like because there's other calls you get from yeah. Yorha that give you orders, and it doesn't change to black and white at those times. All right. So yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. They they give us this particular mission to go take out this Goliath that showed up inside the city ruins, and you go and fight it. And it's, it's a cool boss fight. There's. Um, Kind of goes into like a shooter mode for a while, like a, like an on rail sort of thing. Like it, the camera sort of like, you know, like moving through the scene. It, it's yeah. fun boss fight and everything like that. But I just yeah, couldn't really quite cool. couldn't quite put my finger on it. You also get a flight unit during this part. They send it down to you. You have to go up that's there. That's right. And get inside. Yeah, you have to get up to the building. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's anyway. right. You're like going through the building. Oh, yeah. this fight is so cool. It's fun. This fight. was a really fun. It's fight. really good. Um. So anyway. After you defeat mm-hmm. it, um, it opens this giant hole under in the ground there. There's, it's almost it's just like the, the whole ground in the city just collapses. Yeah. And there was something underneath it the whole time, underneath the combat zone. And uh, back up on the bunker, it's just like a, a thing that reads aliens just comes up on the screen. Yes, but the yeah, idea yeah. is that they're getting readings from the original aliens yeah. who had created these machines. Right, so the aliens that had originally fought against humanity thousands of years ago and 5,000 whatever um, had created these machines and they finally, for the first time in however long it's been, they have gotten a reading from those aliens yes. underground. It's like, and wait a minute. They been were not the expecting this. Yeah, they were not expecting that. It's like, wait a second. You know, uh, unbelievable. The aliens who haven't revealed themselves in hundreds of years were hiding underground. So then the, the world returns to color. I... I don't know why. I don't get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the mission now shifts to collecting data on those aliens underground. Go down there and see what you can find out from their base or facility or bunker down there, whatever they've got. So as you're descending down, um, I think 9S says, this hallway looks pretty old. Look at all these dead machines. That's looks right. like they've been here for a long time. A long time, yeah. You know, what is this place? I don't know. There's nothing like it in the database. So... This is really old. And, and when we're talking old, we mean really old. And we're talking about the lifespan of machines and 
androids, right? <laughs> yeah. So this place has been here for a long yeah. time. Uh, as we're going down, too, this is so interesting because they, they tell us, hey, um, you know, go find the aliens. And 2B is like, all right, let's go. And 9S is like, really? No, you're not going to make a plan or anything? You're just going to, like, jump down there? Right? Yeah, right. Um, so he says, you aren't one for making plans, are you? Right? I thought mm. that was really good. So this gives us a little more insight into 2B as well, um, that she acts on instinct and, yes. and emotion, more or less. Right? Yes. Not so much on, like, the facts and logic right that she has this instinct to her uh which is great because she's an android so she feels her way through situations it you know anyways it it brought it brought to mind to me like a few um like a a few bible verses the take no thought beforehand what you what you do but 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 it will be given you in that very moment like what you should do new testament or what you should say apostles Yeah. yeah And that's that's fascinating because the idea of instinct, if you think about it, now for an android, I guess it's different because they're programmed. But the idea of instinct is like you do a thing, you don't think about doing it, but then your your body, you you just kind of react in a natural way that has probably something to do with like your ancestry or your yeah. lineage going back, right. right? And it's like you you've been like almost programmed in a way through the evolutionary process by your own ancestors to where when you do things instinctually you're not doing things that you would do you're doing things your ancestors would have done sure right and it just got hard coded into you and when yeah. you're not thinking about it the things that you do without thinking are things that were passed down basically through through time yeah. and to be <laughs> Acting on instinct. I just have a hard time even knowing what that means for an android. Sure. Like, it's just kind of like, it, it kind of like broke my brain for a minute. I just was <laughs> thinking about it. I was like, she acts on instinct. That is so, that is so interesting. Yeah. And then, um, of course, we pass through water and descend below the surface of the earth into mm-hmm. the underworld. It is an underworld. Yeah. It is a tomb. It is a crypt. Yes. A world of death. So I think the I use the baptism word a lot. Every game has some point Allusion where that to happens. Symbol. Right? Yeah, right. Every freaking game. Yeah. Uh, but this this is the this would be more anyways. Uh, some maybe something a little more along the lines of like a a ritual washing or something like that because she's about to set foot into this. Well, it's like a temple, but yeah. for the, the enemies, for right? The aliens, it's like the enemies' yeah. temple, right? But she has to undergo this process before she can like enter into the holy sanctuary of um the enemies and of course it changes her and she comes back out and that's where things are very different from her after this point yeah so there's the baptism you get the uh kind of the alien looking architecture of the place energy lighting like really cool yeah it's 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 kind of unsettling um you descend down there and then you get um now we finally do get their names adam and eve adam and eve welcome to the graveyard of our creators loved that line that was freaking hardcore (laughs) yeah right there so you are in the underworld that's where you are um really good and then they show this kind of like the light kind of moves up the windows open or a light turns on a camera yep. was you see basically the decomposed body of yep. the aliens yep that, i don't know they they look you don't get to see them all that close yeah. well at least i wasn't able to maybe maybe you know, we could look closer but, but they look jacked like yeah. they look really yeah. jacked <laughs> <laughs> and like i don't know exactly what happened but um there was a like a, th- this all just reminds me of the movie Prometheus, of course. Yes, you yes, know? it does have that feel to it. Uh, yeah. y- even like the that kind of first room, there's like that sort of cylinder platform, and there's just like the the technology, the architecture of it yeah. looks very Prometheus like. Very much when they're exploring that ship. Yeah, the, where the, the what are they the called? Engineers, the engineers or the architects? architects? It, engineer, it's engineer. Engineers, it's okay. engineer. Where he's like sleeping or whatever. Yeah. Um, so you see them there, and then, yeah, Adam and Eve show up. Um, I want to give some notes here before we talk about Adam and Eve about the fact that the aliens are underground. Oh. This is really – this this drew a pattern for me. Like, I was able to see it immediately, and it's just really crazy. I don't know quite what it's saying yet, but I've got some guesses. So the aliens had a bunker underground, Yes. right? Androids have a space station called a bunker, Yes. first of above. all. It's called a bunker, but it's up. Yeah. So first off, there's the some sky. confusion happening there. There's a flip. Like something that should be below is above, yes. right? But now something that should be above is below. They've mm-hmm. switched places, right? And this is really cool. So the humans are on the moon. The humans are the furthest away. So things have been completely turned upside down. The aliens, not from Earth, live closest to it. 
Yeah. They live literally inside of the Earth. Then on the surface are the alien-created robots. Yes. Then in lower Earth orbit and outer space the are the androids, which are we're getting closer to human, yes. right? The, cl- mm-hmm. the further up we go. Then the humans, the furthest away from Earth are the humans on yep. the moon. Right. But they're the ones that are from Earth. Yes. So we have this complete reversal, almost mm-hmm. like a hierarchy. Right, that just like becomes presented here. Right in this moment, you get to see this, right? Um, It's absolutely crazy. So the earthlings live on the moon and I I have the hardest time knowing exactly what it's saying other than to say that this was not an accident. Yes. This is clearly intentional, right? And and you're seeing kind of this progression going backwards that the aliens are, are native are not native to the earth, but they're the ones in the that earth. are like in it. It's yeah. it, it, it's kind of, anyways, hopefully I have some more insights to that as we go through more of yeah. the game. But it's um, something interesting to point at, out. At now. the moment, it's yeah. worth taking note on, yeah. especially given that the machines are becoming more human. They're, they're yes. starting to act more human, right? Yes. It's so like, it's like as the aliens and by proxy, now the machines mm. got into the earth, they came out of it wanting to be more human. Yes. And that's kind of this whole yes. conversation. Wanting to be a product of the earth. Yes. You know? It's like, oh, screw what we were yes. or, or what we came from. <laughs> or what we were created for. That wasn't interesting at all. Yeah. What's interesting is what we found here in this This earth. is interesting. <laughs> and you can almost imagine that a reverse thing would happen, like with the humans, that the longer they remain separated from earth, the more detached they'll get from it. Yeah. And then the less they will belong yes, here. Right. And that there could, would be a total reversal where all of a sudden the machines are just the new humans and then the humans are the new aliens. Yes. Right? And right. it's like, <laughs> that's when that's when we get into a whole a whole weird spot. So yeah. I look forward uh, to uh, Looking delving more into this more. later. Yeah. Okay, so let's go over this conversation because there's a lot of good dialogue here. Um, again, I kind of brought up uh, how Adam sort of represents the yang and Eve represents yeah. the yin, yep. uh, which is the masculine feminine of the, um, of the yin yang. Yep. Um, so the first thing that Eve says is, hey, can I kill them yet? He's just like <laughs> rearing right. to <laughs> unleash yeah. his rage, his right. desire to murder, kill, yes. whatever, right? It, it's it's unfettered, uh, and, uncontained. And revenge too, because yeah. it was very of, clear of what happened that earlier. We, we were, initiated yeah. this, right? We initiated the whole violent action, yeah. And it's Adam or the Yang that says, relax. Eve, we're still negotiating here. <laughs> See, that's so, what are they negotiating? I love right. it. And you know what's so funny? Adam is so philosophical. <laughs> yes. He has his head in the clouds. Yes. Eve is very well grounded, but Adam is just like, I want to learn all the intricacies of all. I want to comprehend it all. And it's like, you have been sort of human for like one day. Yes. <laughs> like it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Very but, cool. Yeah. I mean, more thoughtful, more orderly. More yes. in control than before, right? Right, yeah. But Eve, very much, yeah. Uh, nope, don't really care about that. Can we just get to the good part? Yeah. Like, you know, so <laughs> good a representation uh, of the yin yang, I think, yeah, very, very, very intentionally. Very good. Um, also, they're wearing clothes now, yeah, they got like leather pants, pants on, leather pants, yeah. This is the garment of skin. Oh, sure. So Adam and Eve. That's a good point. Yeah. As they leave the garden. Yeah. As they get initiated into how crappy the world is. (laughs) Right. Right. They um, are given by God, essentially, but they um, end up wearing these garments of skins. Right. And leather is literally animal skin. Yeah. And so they're wearing garments of skins. We're going to see a progression of this later on. Yes. Especially through Adam, because Adam keeps wearing more and more clothes. Yeah. He gets more and more of the human culture kind of. He's like giving it to himself you know he yeah. wants more of it whereas eve is kind of remaining a little more natural she'll wear the garments of skin but she doesn't exactly graduate to like the garments of linen or oh, the sure. next you know the next love the garments of light or any of that stuff she kind of like is content to do it at this point um but yeah garments of skins how about that yeah very cool i was happy to see that <laughs> yeah so uh and you know, eve says fine you know like fine go ahead do your negotiating here uh so yeah. adam my name is adam the aliens you seek are no longer here. They were wiped out centuries ago by us, the mm. machines. So oh, big crazy. reveal there. The machines yeah, killed their own creators. That's huge. Right? Wiped out. And he says centuries ago. That's yes. Pretty recent, yeah. given the timeline of everything. Right? Yeah. I guess, yeah, considering like the thousands, thousands and thousands of, of yeah. timescales. So yeah. aliens were around up until, up until just a few hundred years ago. Probably, yeah. Um, And who knows, perhaps we'll wipe out the androids next. Machines are weapons capable of evolution. 
So this mm. is finally the reveal, like, yes, they're not just saying random data. No, yeah. they're not just programmed to be a certain way and they can't ever change. They yeah. can evolve. They can mm. gain sentience. They can uh, become something different than they were created to be. Mm. They were, there is not an essence to what makes <laughs> a machine a machine. Yeah, that's crazy. The machines can choose. Yeah. They have the freedom to become what they want. You know what's so funny though? Because the aliens made the machines. So, because you would say if something has an essence, that implies a creator. Yes. But if something doesn't have an essence, that implies not a creator. But if the machines don't have an essence, but they do have a creator. Yes. It's a... I don't know. Uh, I, there's that. That's the life will find a way thing. <laughs> that's right. That aliens tried to control right. something. That's they tried right. to create something with an essence. Yes. And we're going to talk about this with Jurassic Park in a minute. But but it rejected its own essence. Yes, because it, it doesn't really have an essence. There right. is no such thing. Anyway, there's. Yeah. I'm not going down that philosophical rabbit hole quite yet. I just think but. it's funny that Sartre's reason for the um, existence preceding essence was that there is no God or yes. that there can't be a creator. But for the robots, there was a creator, but yes. still the existence preceded the essence. Sure. Even still. That's, yeah. 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 He I, was sort of using it as a way to um, be consistent with his atheism, but I don't, right. but there are a lot of existentialists who are theists too. That was, that's true. Like, Kierkegaard. Yeah. Like that's true. you don't have to be an atheist right. to kind of have that existential good speed. point good point so anyway um <clears throat> let's see where did i leave off uh, eventually the intelligence within our network began to surpass that of our creators you'd probably be surprised at how quickly it happened you destroyed your own creators Ooh. oh there's no need to fret about them they were simple infantile <laughs> almost like plants i guess you'd say that's they, interesting. they held no value to us but the humans on the moon now they are interesting Hmm. Why? Because they are an enigma. They killed uncountable numbers of their own kind and yet loved in equal measure. It's fascinating, don't you think? What could possibly drive such behavior? We have dedicated ourselves to unraveling this riddle of humanity, and now we will allow you to assist us. You were made in their image, after all. We'll assist you in what? It's simple. We need you to locate the humans on the moon and bring them to us. We will then dissect and analyze them in order to drag their secrets forth into the light. Now, there's a little bit of a mistake here on Adam's part. Adam is very naive, right? Yes. He, he sounds well put together like he knows what he's doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. And what makes a human isn't, you can dissect a human all you want. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not going to actually understand well, we talked like, about what a human in, is. Um, Metal Gear Solid, was didn't it? we? Was it Metal Gear? It was. Uh, That's right, because yeah. they talked about the genes. That's yes. right. That's what, right. What, whether it's the genes that make, can you find your purpose, your purpose or, your or like the meaning, or, the yeah. meaning of uh, to what's to be human in the genes? In or the not. genes. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's so, right. This is a lot of this. Well, yeah. I mean, here. this even comes back to making light of the philosopher again. It's like yeah. as he, as Adam progresses in his intelligence and in his mm -hmm. knowledge and his understanding of the when we found him he was infantile he didn't understand yeah, anything he well, why anything. are you attacking me yeah. and oh i should do this when you do that like yeah. he was learning right so he, he's still in that process he's just further along right but yeah honestly we look at that and that's that's ridiculous you're not going right. to find out what a human is by taking it apart yeah by but analyzing the dna and that's the whole thing about making light of yeah. the philosophers, because right. what we understand right now will seem mm. infantile in a hundred years or in two hundred years from now. The mm. things that people believed a few hundred years ago seem really dumb now. Right. But that's the whole point. Like mm. you know, this thing progresses over time, so you can't take it too seriously. You can't sure. take yourself too seriously, or else you start doing stuff like this, thinking you've got it figured out, and you don't. So he thinks he can find out what humanity is all about by. Dissecting them and like that's crazy and, and that, I love I love uh, 9s's response to that. Are you insane? <laughs> We'd never do that. Can you believe this to me? This guy's bonkers like the way he even <laughs> delivers that he's like he cannot believe The yeah. notion it's just it's, it's crazy, right? Why on earth would you even say that right? <laughs> and that's uh, That's fascinating. So the androids have been created the androids seem to be evolving in a similar way yeah. to the role to the machines But there's like a block Yes. There. That's like, you don't second guess the human. No. The reason why you are created, you don't say, you can do whatever you want, but it is going to seem sheer utter madness yeah. to, to like go against the humans. Right. right. Yeah. It's like so, programmed in. It's like their, their, their base assumption of reality right. is you don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So he comes back, uh, Adam does. Well, I suppose this concludes the negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. The yeah. only remaining option is to destroy you. Yeah. The same way we destroyed these pathetic little aliens. So you fight them. There's kind of a, a battle here. Um, at the end of that, time grows short. This here, this is the fate that befell our creators. As mm. for your beloved humans, I guess we'll see, won't we? I think Eve delivers that line. Um, the aliens are already dead. Yeah, we'd better get back to the bunker and report this. Yeah, right? after the battle. Yeah. So they have to get up and tell people like what's going on. Uh, let's see. I don't, I think we oh, might. This is where fast travel. Uh, yes, gets, gets unlocked yeah. here. Yeah, and you can kind of travel back to the bunker, which is they very cool. Teleport. It's like a Several teleportation yeah, versus well flight suits up and back. I had a theory of what this was, but I'll wait till the game gets a little further on okay. before I say it. Yeah. Um. It may not be teleportation. It may be you know. Well, just something else. <laughs> yes, uh, your body being completely reconstructed exactly, with exactly. your same memories or yes, whatever, yes, right? Yes. There's a whole thought experiment along those lines. Well, Star with, Trek, right? Yes. If yeah. you, with when when you beam, that's you, right. You're basically just taking apart atom by atom a person, then the reconstructing them exactly the same way. But is but that not the same exactly. person? Right. Is it really the same person? And this is why mm -hmm. certain characters mm -hmm. kind of refuse it. They just don't ever yeah. want to beam at all. It's like. I, you're destroying right. me. Right. Like, I don't know if I'll be the same person, oh. especially early on when the technology is sort of first being like introduced in the yeah. timeline of Star Trek. It's like, people are really wary about that. Like the movie, the prestige had something going yeah. on there too. Oh, definitely did. It's like definitely did just really interesting. Yeah. Endlessly fascinating to me. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So after reporting to the commander, um, she basically, Let's see. Is this the part? Two B and Nine S are told to keep it secret. Oh yeah, they're told not to tell anybody about like what they learned. Yeah, that, that the aliens, aliens are dead. dead. Yeah, they're not supposed one. to say anything yep. about that. And the mission is now changing to learn everything that they can about Pascal. They're told specifically like uh, go learn and gather data on Pascal. Hmm. Like this is uh, something we need to know more about these machines that are unplugged from their network. Right. That are not hostile. And that are no longer seeking to kill. Like they're not fulfilling to go, their programming. Yeah, yeah find why? out more about them. Yeah, and so the the kind of whole the whole mission is now shifting in light of this discovery. So, I actually think that's a good place to leave off. Okay, cool. Um, and then next time for sure we can get through um, the end ending of a. ending A. I, I think that'll be uh, best. So we'll have the Forest Kingdom, the Flooded City, and then uh, kind of the final portion of uh the game leading up to ending a so it's kind of three big sort of levels i Very guess you nice. could call it um and some interesting yeah. stuff in between you know what's crazy man like <clears throat> playing this game is really fun but talking about this game is even more fun it really is <laughs> it's it really I, is it just it gets my mind going yeah I love it's it. it's it's fantastic game um yeah. and and i really liked it the first time i played it mm. but I, I think almost with every game we play it's like there's a really like another level of appreciation you level. get when yeah. you're looking at it like this closely um xeno gears was certainly that way and like this is so far i'm learning a ton of stuff i didn't know before so um good stuff um so yeah ending a for next time that's that's where we'll leave off for this week thank you for watching we'll see you again next time peace out